Thor, which is yet another next generation royalty free video codec. So, um, I'm just one member of a team of several people. Um, Thor was mostly being developed by Howard Colseth and Peace Le Beyond Guard, um, and also Stainar and um, also in Oslo, and Mo Zanati, who is one of the co chairs of the NetPC working group, is on the team. So we've been working on Thor for more than one year and we've contributed it to NetBC Working Group. So the core of it is ideas that were developed for um, by Cisco or Tandor as it was then for um, H.265 and during the H.265 process. So it's quite a familiar architecture that you'll see from H.265 and um, BP9, BP10. Um, but hopefully stepping around and avoiding the, those troublesome patterns. So initially we had, we were all working on the video conferencing side, although previously I've been in broadcasting too. Um, so the initial test model was focused on low delay, low bit rate and video conferencing. More recently in the last few months we've been trying to extend to rapid random access broadcast streaming applications um, adding those kind of coding modes and, and doing some optimization. But one of our focuses in um, in H.265 actually but also in Thor has been really to try and have a slightly better take on complexity. Um, I think those of you who've been working on um, H.265 encoding will know that the last few percent of gain um, comes at a great deal of computational expense. And so it's helpful that at least you start off with something that's quite simple to, to implement. So we've been looking at VLC coding, perhaps rather than arithmetic coding, although we're quite easy about exactly what tools we use if something good comes along. And simpler loop filtering. These codecs all seem to have a large number of loop filters. And at one point there were three in H.265 and now there's only two. But uh, we will end up with several, I should think. <coughs> so here's the basic encoder architecture, which is the same encoder architecture that you will see for any codec, essentially. Where you, have, you can reorder frames to, to go in a reconstructed frame memory, perhaps. You have loop filters and then you reconstruct and you use that for prediction in a kind of closed loop way. So that's nothing new. The basic block structure is 64 by 64, what we call super blocks, equivalent to coding tree blocks. Um, and we have a quad tree architecture which goes back many, many years. Um, so we can split into coding blocks of varying size, sizes right down to 8 by 8. And you can have multiple prediction blocks per coding block. So we have a quad tree for the prediction structure, and then we have um, prediction blocks so we can split, um, re do rectangular splits, vertical or horizontal, or four square, uh, or two by two split. And we can also split the transform units so independently of the prediction units. So we can have transforms larger than prediction units just as um, has been discussed for VP10. <clears throat> so here we use some cunning terminology. So we have intra, we have inter zero, which some of you might recognize as a cunningly disguised skip, with MV index and no residual information. We have inter one, which is essentially merged. You just copy the motion information from a neighboring block. We can have two skip candidates at the moment and um, you will send residuals in the case of merge or inter one. And then the rest is standard inter prediction where you explicitly code a motion vector, you explicitly code a residual and so on. Now these coding block modes can be, uh, are structured in, along with other information into a super block, uh, into a super mode, so, sorry, which is coded via uh, VLC codes. <coughs> We also have recently um, been doing some work on Bipod. Bipod was in our first initial release, but um, 
we've been optimizing exactly how that works recently. So that has two predictors um, which are combined with a half half average in the usual kind of way. So there's no weighted prediction at present. So on the interest side, it's really pretty simple. But although we have all these different block sizes, we have um, quite a simple set of, um, of, of predictors. So we have DC vertical or horizontal, and there are five angular yeah. modes at the moment. So we don't support anything like the 33-odd modes that H.265 has. So our intro frames are really pretty simple at the moment, and that really reflects the, the video conferencing um, heritage of, of the codec in its initial incarnation, because intro frames are just a pain in the neck, and you want as few of them as possible, and they just restart streams. So at the moment, that's pretty simple. It works pretty well, but it's something that we could improve a lot in the future. So on the inter side, again, we have simpler filters, at least in terms of numbers of taps, than H.265. So we have six tap filters. But currently, they're signed 8-bit taps, and that does mean that intermediates are more than 16 bits. So that probably has to change at some point um, when we can tune that correctly. Um, there is a special filter for the half-half -half position, which is a essentially pretty low pass, because you find that when you do vertical and horizontal filtering concatenated, you kind of double the amount of ringing that you have. And so having a special filter in that position gives some surprising amount of gain in the half half position. And then we have four tap separable filters for chroma, and we just use the same motion vectors. So we end up with one eighth pixel resolution because everything is 420 at the moment. And we can have up to mul we have multiple reference frames. So we, at the moment, we have no explicit um, fancy reference buffer display buffer management because that's all tricky stuff. Um, so we just have a sliding window and we have an index into that and that's all very simple. But we can have up to four um, combined two at a time. Um, now we did have support in the first release that we made um, in July, uh, reordered coding. So you just have a frame number and you send stuff out of order and it just works. Um, you can you can support, um, I think it's by a macro in the initial release, but um, it's stack, sort of MPEG-2 style B frames where you have P, B, 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 well not quite MPEG-2 because you can predict a B from another B, and then you can have dy dyadic, i.e. hierarchical B structures as well. Um, and you can have a periodic intro or you can have just one. So all the sort of coding modes that you'd expect are supported. So the transforms were something that we could take from um, H.265 because we put them in there. Um, but we've added the 66, 64 by 64 transform, um, which is in the same style. So the idea is that it's an integer approximation to the DCT, which um, maintains the symmetries, some of the symmetries that you have in the... Um, in the, in the sort of in the mathematical DCT, and you can have a partial butterfly implementation, which reduces the complexity of implementation somewhat, not completely. So there was a huge battle in 265 about um, lifting implementations versus partial butterfly. And essentially, lifting is a nightmare. So the partial butterfly is what we went 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 with there, and it's something that we own. We put in. Now, we also have, we're lucky to have deep locking IPR going back some time, as it was one of Giesler's specialities in HT64 days. And we have, have put in a much simplified version of what we contributed to D65 into Thor. So this only um, deals with pixels two on each side of a line. Um, unlike three, I think it is in two six five, there isn't a strong weak filter switch, and it's also only eight, eight by eight edges, so it's relatively simple. It's not as simple as I would like because it's still it's doing 
switching on or off per row by looking at the actual pixels, but I think we're past that point of being able to avoid doing that because it gives such a big gain. So that's quite nice and quite simple. <clears throat> but we also have an additional loop filter, which I don't have the maths for, but um, Donna put in for us earlier, so the constrained low pass filter. So that's um, essentially just doing a, a simple um, adjustment of plus or minus one, um, plus or minus one value, <coughs> essentially to knock off the peak or knock off the the bottom of a, of a trough in your signal where it's over ringing. And that actually has been worth, say, two or three percent in total, a surprising amount, um, but possibly even more subjectively. And one of the things that it does, too, give, given our fairly simple intro, is clean up a lot of intro artifacts because you can get quite harsh predictions by um, angular prediction that then leave artifacts on, which you can then clean up with this filter. So we can turn that on and off per super block. Um, it probably helps with the deblocking as well a little bit. Generally, these kind of second loop filters do a lot subjectively. That's well beyond the two or three percent that they give objectively. And SAO gives very significant subjective gains, albeit at the cost of softening things a little in H265. So I think this is a, an area of further research and development. We have a new design in progress, which gives you know, more objective gain, um, which is a lot more adaptive, but still similar and very similar. <clears throat> so entropy coding, um, this is one of those things that perhaps matters less than other tools, but absorbs an awful lot of discussion and argumentation. So we went for VLC coding because it's something where, again, we own a lot of IP and we have a lot of experience with, and it's very, very fast. So in 265, we proposed a low complexity profile, which eventually was squashed through lack of support from others. But it allows, although it costs you something in objective performance, it's not as much as you think. And it allows you to do other complex things, particularly if you are interested in making a good encoder. Um, I actually swapped out, H in one of our H.265 implementations, I swapped out the CABAC coefficient coding for the VLC coder. And it was very substantially faster, and the, the loss was of the order of 3% or so. And that, the, the gain in speed was sufficient that you could consider using using actual bit counts in RDO in very fast real-time implementations, and that's an interesting thing to do. And that starts recovering you at least what you've lost. So that's one thing that is, is a very interesting area to debate. Um, we've had discussions with the Dara team about PPQ as well, and whether we could port that into full as an art to do this to, to look at that. So, the transform coding is very similar to what we initially proposed for 265. Um, it's forward scan instead of backward scan um, with the termination symbol, but basically it's run level coding. So on, it says in optimization, so I suppose it more means encoder features. Um, so at the moment we can have a fast, we have various encoder settings which turn on a fast search, which um, we have sad based block matching, we don't try to do SATD or anything like that. We can have a fast intro or inter selection just based on SAD, so for our speed settings and we have <coughs> We do a full RDO search for coding block size and coding block mode. So at the moment we don't have any shortcuts for that and the other encoding settings, um, but that's something that we would look to introduce as it matures. 
So we end up with three complexity operating points. At the moment, there's a low delay and a random access config out on the web, but we also have been doing experiments with what we call high delay, <coughs> which is a single in track, but with reordered coding, just like in a random access case. Um, we also have put a little bit of time into doing some SIMD optimization. At least that helps us judge complexity a little bit better. We don't want to sink ourselves into optimizing tools that we later um, decide to drop, but it means that it's, um, it's a bit better to work with and to do experiments with. So we'll carry on doing that. <clears throat> oh, I should say with the SIMD stuff, we have a framework that we've been using internally <coughs> for um, platform independent intrinsics, which are just wrappers around the various different platforms, and that allows us to prototype CD um, kernels really pretty quickly. Um, so currently, we are heavily into doing extensive IPR reviews, going over everything that we have, everything that we're planning to do against vast amounts of results of patent searches, which is very time consuming using in-house lawyers and external experts, and none of that is fun, and none of that is very interesting. It has to be done. But on the more fun and interesting side, we've really been getting deeply into tuning and reworking the syntax, um, especially for the reordered coding and the file prediction and the multi-ref cases, because with VLC coding, you kind of have to do a lot of tuning by hand, which is the downside of it. You can't throw it at some meat grinder probability estimator and it will just come out fine. You have to do some work to work out what your code width should be and what's the most likely and, and so on. So we've been doing that and that's been giving us some good gains. And then we've been tuning encoding parameters reference selection and so on for the random access case and that's been giving us some gains too. We have that new CLPF loop filter design I mentioned. We've also been investigating new interprediction tools to kind of get around some, some issues around IP but also to try and um, exploit ideas around <coughs> how you can generate better predictions from the predictions you already have. I can't say too much about any of that because it's subject to things like IP review and, and making patent applications to protect ourselves. <coughs> and on our list to do is to improve our intro coding. Um, we also need to think about parallel processing tools. We propose tiles in 265. We want to it's something that got picked up on in BP9. It's something that is useful as a, as a general purpose parallelization tool, even though it hits your, your bit rate performance a little bit. Um, generally, we don't have any high level syntax. So we have ad hoc framework <coughs> headers, um, which I was reminded today are not even by the mind. So, so we need to. Think a bit more about syntax, and those things can get you into trouble, so you need to, you need to be careful that kind of stuff. Then, one of my bugbears has been resolution adapt adaption. Um, so, there's been a huge amount of work out in the MPEG community around um, spatial scalability and that kind of thing. And actually, in many use cases, what you need to do is not send multiple resolutions, you need to send the right resolution, and you need to be able to adapt. And so H.263 style resolution adaption, which is also in VP8 and VP9, seems like a sensible thing to be at some point. Then we don't have any audio queue at the moment, it's kind of in the code, it doesn't really give any gains, so we've probably broken something, so we need to fix that. And then there's the whole set of things that you could do to improve perceptual coding. So in DALI you have built-in perceptual coding, you have um, masking and quantization matrices, and we are essentially code in the do flat coding at the moment, and we need to at least add some tools to, to allow some perceptual coding techniques to be supported. We have nothing of that at the moment. 
So where are we in terms of compression performance? So um, we are focused on HD, because our code is fast. And um, we, so we've coded um, our low delay configuration across a range of pictures that we care about, maybe a bit biased towards video conferencing. We're about 20% behind um, HM13.0, which I think is pretty much, last time we looked at was a little bit better <coughs> than X265, but X265 may have improved since then, so I'm not sure how that all fits together. Um, so we've only gained 1.3% since IETF 93, which was um, a few months ago. But we've had some really big gains on the high delay B configuration, because basically we've stopped doing stupid things about what nodes to choose and what codes to use for signaling um, uh, reference indices and things like that. And in that case, so we are 25% now, so we're, respect we're respectively close to the low delay case, and we've got about 17% better since then. I think we didn't even post any figures back then. So those are currently on our work in progress, which isn't unfortunately yet public, so it's subject to tool review, but I think we'll end up with something like that and hopefully a bit better by the time the next IET meeting that we should be able to make all this public. So that's the detail, and you can see those are the pictures that we've chosen. The outlier is BQ Terrace, which is very highly textured, lots of edges, lots of detail and is particularly well coded by um, H.265. I suspect that that was one of the pictures that swayed the choice of the interpolation filters along with BQ square in H.265, and so particularly well suited. So a lot of that comes from low QP, um, high quality um, settings where and having very accurate frequency domain filters are, are particularly good. So that's where we are overall. A um, little bit about the alerts, but I don't really have anything to add to what Tim said earlier. Um, we're working out at the engineering level how this is actually going to work in terms of coming up with a joint proposal in terms of how it all fits with um, IETF and NetVC. So we haven't had any actual meetings, any face-to-face -face discussions between engineers, so we'll see what happens. We are keen to work in IETF and NetBC and produce a standard and a specification, but we will see what transpires when everyone gets to know. And that's where the source game is. It's on GitHub. If you search for Cisco Thor, you will find us. So that's everything that I was going to say. Any questions? Oh. You mentioned your, uh, your CPU size goes down, goes down to 8x8. Eight eight. Uh, now, 265, you know, in all codecs allows yeah. splits. If you mentioned there's no splits to the intra level, do you allow, do you allow a 4x4 four four split at the 8x8 eight eight level or not? Uh, that's for intra. For intra, no. I don't think that. Sorry? Are you going to be, is there a reason for that? Or? I don't think there's a, I don't think that there's a particularly strong reason to do that for, for HD. But I mean that, that, that can be tuned as to, uh, as according to how, how necessary it is. Yeah? Uh, this is a question that's also to Alex, uh, and I forgot to ask it at his uh, talk. Are you going to support interlace? There's an awful lot of interlace IP, and I think it's almost certain that we would not support specific interlace bitstream tools. But interlace metadata saying your stream is a load of fields or it's a load of interlace frames with top field first or bottom field first, I think that, that makes sense. If you want to have a codec that has the widest possible use, 
then there are many uses where people want the format out that they put in. So interlaced metadata is probably okay, but interlaced tools, I think even in H.264, say MBAFF, hardly anyone uses that. So it's a, it's a pointless source of bugs in my opinion. Uh -huh. We're pretty much in the same boat where we're not really interested in interlaced tools, and on top of that, our codec is has been designed for the web, where there's not really a lot of interlaced content, and people are better off the interlacing beforehand, so you no know, from us. Yeah. Uh, did you find that the constrained low pass filter that it caused some loss of detail? Maybe you know, you're using it for <coughs> Not, not noticeably. I think because you only change it to a maximum of plus or minus one, um, and because you can switch it on and off. I mean, it possibly you you might be able to. Um, so, yeah. You should look at the metric you use for the decision to switch it on and off. We, so you don't lose the detail in a single frame, right? But you're applying it over and over again as things move. And so it can build up. But but if you if you use a slightly smarter metric, you can prevent most of that loss. Yeah, so you can so we don't apply it every frame, so we apply it every group of frames. And you can also reduce so be looking at things like reducing the signaling overhead by only applying it, only being able to apply it where um, it wasn't skip, for example. So All right, well, we already do that, right? Yeah. So if you if you apply it when it's skip, clearly you're applying it to the same thing over and over and over. So we don't want to do that. Yeah, I meant if you are coding a residual, the yeah. losses will build up. <coughs> Do you have like a projected date of when this history will be more or less fixed? No, I mean that's when okay. when will NetBC be finished? I mean yeah. we we are we are throwing it into the mix. We're not producing a, a completely independent thing right. that we will use by I feel we want it to be contribution towards whatever NetBC produces or whatever the alliance uh, for open media produces. So I don't think we have any dates in mind. We're just trying to make stuff better as fast as we can. Yeah. Um, since most of the coding tools are so very similar to HEVC, and there are, there are some key differences as well, like the VLC and so on, have you done any uh, com uh, performance comparison tests across these two? Yeah, so, well, I'm, the numbers that I have are against HM. Right. So, so that, they, they show us that. So we did do comparisons um, for our ATF presentation against BP9 and X265, um, which will be on another slide I can show you, but they may well be out of date. So let me Sure that I've got that actually. Um, so, roughly speaking, we thought um, we were we were doing a little bit. We were a little bit faster and a little bit better than X two six five back in July um, at the, the sort of highest performance level. So, I would expect that we would we would be pretty close as things go on, but you've done a lot of optimization recently, it's probably increased your speed. Yeah. 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 Yeah.